All right. Listen. Our 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 hearts fell last night, and I can't tell you how many people were um, texting me last night. Tony Casillas and uh, Seth Joyner last night. We were all talking about Demar Hamlin and what the doctors are doing. And I'll tell you this, man: having a doctor and having a staff and the first responders there on that field last night was the best of America. They saved his life on the 40 yard line giving CPR as a player and all those guys watching that that's the best of America watching those doctors were both the Bengals and the bills saving a kid's life. There was no team. It was one team. Let's bring in Dr. Bruce Grossinger here. He's on our post game show and Dr. Grossinger, that that to me last night was the best of what America is and what you guys do when it comes to protecting players and injuries when you notice it and see it right away. I mean, they saved his life last night, didn't they, and the care they gave them before they sent him to the emergency room. I have no doubt that they did save his life. If they did not perform CPR, if they did not perform on-field defibrillation, if they did not support his airway, immediately sent him via ambulance to the University of Cincinnati and give him the best of care, including putting him in a relative fetal barb coma to control his vitals, he would have expired. And I referenced somebody who was not as lucky. Coach Mike Leach had slightly different pathology, also had a massive heart attack, but was at his home for minutes or hours. He didn't have a chance. And when he when when Mike Leach went to the hospital, it was over. He was he was brain dead when he arrived. Right now, we have a limited amount of data. But as a neurologist who presides over end of life, who's unfortunately very familiar with hypoxic and anoxic post arrest coma and the intricate treatment therein, I would feel I'm in a good position to answer some of your questions and the viewers questions at this late hour in your show. Let's do this. Did they give him a tracheotomy? you think, on the field there to clear the passage? Do you think they did that? And and because you saw the players when uh, I saw one of them say there's a ton of blood. I mean, I was, do you think that they did that just to get him more oxygen? Because, and, and explain this to me too, if you can, is the amount of time that he was out a factor in his recovery coming back when, we're talking about neurological stuff. I'll answer your second question first. The amount of time was crucial. It was everything. And oftentimes, on average, an average person could tolerate three minutes of relative hypoxia, where the heart is not pumping oxygenated blood to the brain. However, in the case of Mr. Hamlin, we have a 24-year-old elite athlete in the peak of health whose mitochondria and whose system is at the highest level of performance. And we can infer that Mr. Hamlin could tolerate longer. So nobody knows that. If indeed they got to him quickly, it all has to do with when sinus rhythm was restored. He presumably was in ventricular tachycardia or V-fibrillation. Two agonal rhythms that are insufficient for allowing people to live. So yes, that amount of hypoxia is crucial. Whether or not a, uh, a tube was placed with or without a cut down is really immaterial. We know a tube was placed in a timely fashion. As to the blood on the scene, I wasn't there. I, I don't want to speculate. As, But I think the crucial issue now is where he's at. What is his neurological exam? They're starting to light him up. There's no need to sedate him anymore. And what they're doing is they're examining him. They're seeing if he has any signs of life, if he is aware of his environment. So as a neurologist, the, the critical threshold between life and death really is the awareness of the environment. So if he shows any ability to withdraw in a purposeful fashion to pain, if he could withdraw not in a decerebrate or spinal cord fashion, but instead of fashion showing that the brain is reacting to the environment, 
That is the key threshold. And if DeBar Hamlin can react to his environment and he can perceive his environment, he could start to recover. And if he cannot, or if his if he's lost brainstem function, pupillary function, the ability to a respiratory drive, there's no doubt he's going to be subject to an EEG, electroencephalography, to see if there are any brain w- rhythms. And if, in the worst case scenario, there's no sign of life, there's no brainstem function, and he has a flat EEG, at that point, unfortunately, as a doctor, they would, the next step would be an apnea test to see whether he has the ability to sustain respiration. And these cells are located in the medulla, the very bottom of the brainstem. And if he, he cannot, using Harvard criteria with respect to brain, unfortunately, in the worst case scenario, let me say this is all hypothetical, he would be declared, as Mike Leach was, not, not being alive, and he'd be declared expired. In, in practicality, Mr. Cilio, having dealt with so many of these, there's no rush, all right? This is an incredible shot to the family, to the world, to the team. There's no rush. So presiding over these matters as a neurologist, as a chief of neurology for 30 plus years, what I'll do, even if I think the patient is not alive, much like Mike Leach, Mike Leach, they kept it on for another day, if you recall. And they didn't declare him until they were able to fly the family in. While he was still, quote, alive, uh, whatever that means, he hadn't been declared. And they let the family spend time with him at his bedside. They let the family assimilate the seriousness of the deceased. Now, I'm hoping that isn't the case, but we know nothing more than what was, I guess, Ian Rappaport put out something a a couple hours ago from a close friend of his. And that didn't tell us much. It just said that he's sleeping, that he has been intubated. His vitals are stable. Now, that's good and bad. The good news is that you have a restoration of sinus rhythm. Apparently, with the ventilator, he's oxygenating well, probably over 90%. But the, the key question is, what's going on with the brain? Did the brain suffer necrosis, anoxia, critical enough that he won't wake up again and could be in a coma? Or... Is he having, or his neurons bouncing back? You have billions of neurons. Being a young guy, if I see at this point, if I see anything encouraging, even brainstem reflexes, pupillary reflexes, if I take a neural hammer and, and I put pressure on his sternum, and if I see a purposeful with, with withdrawal, withdrawal, that's a um, primitive response, but it tells me there's some cortical neurons functioning. Now, again, phenobar has a long half-life. So we have to be very careful to not misinterpret the effects of sedation as being low cortical function. Yale's got a question here, but I want to ask you something, Doc. I've never seen this before as a player. I first thought it was a head trauma injury, and I had never seen a blunt injury like that to the chest where the amount of force gave him and basically gave him a heart attack. Am I right? Is that is that fair in how you how I'm describing it? Because I've we've all been hit with helmets in the chest like that. And when you're at that level, these are train wrecks. But I've never seen a player go down like that. And you knew something immediately was wrong. But concussions, you're wobbling around. Um, have you ever seen anything like that before? Yes. Um and I'll give you a reference. There's a diagnosis, which is called commotio cortis. I'll spell that. Any, all the listeners, uh, viewers could, could Google it. It's C-O-M-M-O-T-I-O cortis, C-O-R-D-I-S. And that's usually seen in 10 to 15-year-old baseball players, male uh, boys. And what happens is uh, they get hit with a, with a baseball moving at 90 miles an hour. Strikes right at the chest. It causes often fatal arrhythmias where the, the, the heart goes from a normal sinus rhythm to a ventricular fibrillation. And now, because of a guy that we all know here at Philly, Hank Gathers, who had a Marfan syndrome, a cardiomyopathy, 
died of sudden death. And my good friend, Bo Kimball, as you know, Bo Kimball Foundation, we're getting into basketball. That's why we're Rover Sports. We could row from basketball to football. And you can too. <laughs> and so here in Philly, Hank Gathers, his death prompted defibrillators everywhere. In every country club, in every golf course, in every basketball arena, and certainly at uh, the Cincinnati football field. And that, and Hank Gathers, and Bo Kimball, who is a great player, a good friend of mine, and, and a, his foundation. So I believe he didn't have a heart attack per se. They use the word cardiac arrest now. And now I'm getting into detail. There's something called a myocardial infarction, where the heart, because of usually coronary artery disease, like Mike Leach is a perfect example, or our friend uh, Tony, you know, who, who, who expired in the last year, Tony Saragusa of the Goose, he had a massive heart attack. So the pathology is different. This is a heart gets jolted, usually right after the, there's QRS complex, it, it, unlucky. So there's probably a million people get hit in the chest, but unlucky that this force was so hard, a very blunt force with severe intensity, and also hitting him at the exact wrong time in his electrocardiogram to, to cause this heart to go commodus, uh, which basically means commotion, chaos, and stop beating normally. Very unusual. The last time I've heard of a player dying on the field of play was Chuck Hughes, and we're going back over 50 years ago. This is very unusual, very infrequent, and most people have not seen it. There's also baseball players wear a Kevlar document, and in fact, here in Philly, there's a guy named Vito, Rob Vito, who actually has a company uh, that actually, uh, for particularly baseball catchers, but also certain baseball players, to protect them from sudden death, sudden death from commotio cordis. I believe this was blood trauma. If you look at it, you couldn't imagine any more blood trauma to the exact area, which caused at that exact time the heart to stop beating regularly. And that's, in my view, the pathology here. Finally here, um, does he survive? And I guess that's an open question here on this because he could theoretically be technically alive, but this is all going to, in your opinion, the big concern right now is neurological stuff. Is that correct, you think? 100%. The concern is that, it, it, is that the brain is supported through this time, which it is at a wonderful Cincinnati Medical Center, and that this brain is given time to recover. And, and, and being a young guy, there's no rush to declare. And also because of the suddenness of this, also dealing from a humanistic standpoint, uh, th give him a time, give, give the sedatives, the phenobarbital time to completely get out of his system. And he's being examined, believe me, every hour, even more frequently. And everybody's praying. And, and I'd be there as a doctor holding hands with the family and, and, and sitting there right there praying because it's in God's hands right now. All we can do as doctors at this point is to support him. There's no snake oil to cause any neurons which have died. So there's no procedure right now that you'd be going through. It's just time seeing what happens, right? Totally observational. There's wow. Other than supporting him, we're dealing with any cardiovascular complications in the future, so, which we don't know about, such as another arrhythmia, pneumonia, any of these secondary complications. We'd be focusing 100% on neurological function. And right now, there is kind of a, um, they went dark, so to speak. We, we don't know. And appropriately, this is a privacy matter. It's a horrible matter. It's a, and it's terrible. And usually, if he were to come out of it and start moving again, such as uh, here in Philly with Josh Sweat, you know, totally different disease. But a guy who was knocked unconscious here at the Eagles game, it was, it was not moving on the field. So that similarity occurred. But guess what? He went to the hospital. He was moving again. He had all of his tests and he was discharged. Usually when there's good news, uh, usually, unfortunately, they, this information will be readily shared. We haven't heard anything, Dan, and that's a little bit ominous. Can I get an eagle question from you? Go ahead. Um, Jalen Hurts, is this more like a rotator cuff injury that we're talking about here? Because some pitchers in baseball can still throw the ball with, I guess there's grades on your, on your rotator cuff. 
Um, it, usually I'm hearing because Roethlisberger had this injury that Jalen has, and he was out like three weeks. Is this a rest issue? And do you think Jalen is going to need surgery in the offseason to repair anything structurally when it comes to um, him moving forward? Great question. This is not a rot- – just to explain and d- diagnose, rotator cuff muscles are muscles surrounding the shoulder. The deltoids, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus. As far as we know, those those muscles are uninjured. What is injured, what is causing pain, you'll see me pointing to an area between my right here. <laughs> I'm looking backwards, my clavicle and my sternum. So that joint, which is a mobile joint, is an area w- which was inflamed and which was not totally separated, but slightly separated, and some of the fibers connecting the sternoclavicular joint were disrupted and are now healing. So I believe this is something, usually a two to three, two to three week injury. It all has to do with pain tolerance. His shoulder is stable. It was stable at all times because he was able to throw those two 30 yard passes in the second half of that game. But you have, but he's our treasure. We like to keep Jalen Hurts in bubble wrap because in my mind, it's certainly in light of, the uh, the Gardner bitch who failed experiment, uh, <laughs> one of the worst games I've seen uh, <laughs> ever in, a, in an Eagles uniform. That is one first down with 12 <laughs> seconds left. That was epic. And I'm an Eagle fan for 50 years, uh, a literally season ticket holder. So that was the worst. I, I thought I've seen it all. But also his inability, Minshew's inability to connect a five-yard pass with Goddard to actually miss it by five yards and an inability to find a second read and hearing footsteps and also seeing ghosts. You know, there was a guy, Sam Darnold, who admitted he whispered seeing ghosts. He was seeing ghosts. So in my view, what I hear, and I'm not the exact guy making the decision, Gerald Hurts will suit up against the Giants. It's a very important game for us, and I'm hoping they lay down. It's a 14-point spread. <laughs> so as an Eagles fan, I want to have that first week off. I want that bye week. Although I'm not really looking forward to playing the Cowboys after, if indeed it is the Cowboys in the divisional round, it'll be great. It'll be great for Philly and Dallas. It'll be great for you, Dan. But uh, that's where we are right now. Right now, uh, I think the last thing I want to say about Hamlet is they may not play that game again. To ask those, um, those Bills to fly back to Cincinnati to play a game in that stadium at this time, I think discretion is a better part of valor. And they're hoping that they can play out the last week and not need for seeding, not need to play that game again. And I think that's a wise decision. Look at doctor, man. Look at this guy could break down a clavicle injury and also do Minshew shitty play this past weekend. I love it. <laughs> we'll catch you on the post game show. Thank you so much, Dr. Grossinger. Maybe tomorrow. You might have more. I have a feeling that we might – I'd love to come on your show tomorrow sure. with more time because this is really the international news. This is really the forefront of everything. And uh, and uh, we have a Mark Gastineau, it's our mutual friend. You may have remembered that you and I chatted with the sack master some time ago and you spoke to my, my, my son, Spencer. So this is the second time I have the privilege of speaking with you. And I want to thank Joe Krause, Jacob Media, Xander Krause, everybody for this opportunity and wish you all a blessed night and blessings and prayers to DeMar Hamlet. Absolutely. Thank you so much, doctor. We will have you on again as soon as possible. Thank you, my friend. Have a good night, Dan. You got it. That is Bruce Grossinger. Don't forget you can catch him on our post game show. Boy, he broke it down really wonderful there too, you know, and guys like that saving lives, telling you what these doctors did to save that man's life. I tell you what, man, I was always in great care when I had doctors around me when I was in the NFL and college football. Thank you guys so much for coming aboard. I appreciate it. Please hit the like button till tomorrow, 3 to 6 Eastern. Hopefully, we have some more fabulous news on DeMar, and we're able to report some great news. We get ready for the Giants also as we go into the weekend. Thank you guys for telling me happy birthday. It is my birthday today. Thank you very much. Till tomorrow, 3 to 6 Eastern. We'll see you on the flip side.